And um, you brought that up earlier. A lot of times, even our own ethnic groups will allow ourselves to have certain stereotypes about ourselves or to allow ourselves to use certain words in our context, but then if other people use it, we get highly offended by it. And I don't think that that's yeah. anything just in the African-American community. Like, you know, with a lot of times white citizens will get upset because they'll hear, you just mentioned the N-word, they'll hear the, N- hear the N-word mentioned or the B-word mentioned in rap videos, and then, they, you know, when they use the word, then people that are speaking really are looking at them all cross eyed because it doesn't have the same context, but coming from that society, but a lot of times they don't understand that. And you can even say the same thing with other stereotypical words. I know some folks of mine that are um, Latin American or Hispanic citizens, and they will, you know, they'll use derogatory terms. Like I believe one of them is the word taco to basically is their version of an Uncle Tom, and the same with Apple for the Native Americans. But, you know, if they use those terms, it's all right in those contexts, but, you know, Somebody else says that, like an African American says that to a Mexican person, it might be a fight on their hands. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, and, and internalized oppression is one way to think about that, or racialism, um, that somehow if we internalize the the negative and hostility and dehumanization that other people have used against us, against our own people, you know, we're thinking not only is that a problem from the standpoint of, you know, treating other people or carrying on a an enslavement sort of mentality, uh, there's also the reality of, you know, research. recent research has, has pointed out the importance of um, health, the health effects around yeah. internalized oppression. So, you know, there's more research now that demonstrates that, for example, for black men, we know that if you've experienced racism, it affects how long you've been on the planet. Um, when they look at sort of different sort of uh, DNA evidence, but black men who actually experience racism and also have hostility and hatred towards other black people, they live even less longer. And the argument in that work is that um, just because you look at other people who li- like you and see them as less important doesn't mean you're not also directing a hostility towards yourself. You can't just sort of dismiss yourself from a group when your hatred is is directed towards a smaller portion of that group. And um, I think that's a very interesting notion about, you know, what it means to swallow the Kool-Aid of racial inferiority. And that's another thing I was wondering what your thoughts on this topic were, because one of the people that I've heard people talk about in different contexts, and it comes up a lot of times, definitely when sometimes you talk to your white peers and things of that nature, is this whole concept of can an African-American or any minority actually truly be racist or biased? Because, you know, there are some that will argue that that's almost impossible because of the nature of the fact that we've been the victims of bias for so long that it's not even possible for us to be racist or to have these kind of biases, but it seems to me that that's a, 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 faulty note, a faulty notion, but I have heard that argument given that an African-American male or an African-American in general cannot be racist because the racism system was not created by them, so therefore they cannot be racist or something along those lines. Oh, were you talking to me? Or, or yeah, talking to you. I was talking to you. I was just wondering what, the, what your, oh, yes. what, what, from the psychology standpoint, what your views of that kind of uh, attitude was and how you cope with those people that would try to give those arguments. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm not a um, fan of that view. And I remember it because we used to think of systemic racism and if, if black people do not have positions of power, how could, if, if systemic racism is about power, do black people uh, have the capacity if they're not at the highest rung of the system and I think I don't agree with that. I think you, you know the issues of how people, um, if you think about systemic racism, you need people who commit acts, uh, heinous acts of, of um, dehumanization, but you also need people to to not do things and not respond. And so uh, that that ability of Acts of omission as well as commission are just as important 
to keeping systemic racism alive. And the question is, are there are there people, um, in many respects, we could say, um, those those contributors to systems are still carrying on racism. And so in that sense, I think, just looking at systemic racism alone, that's one reason. Um, but there's other ways to keep people out that are not just systemic, that are also spiritual and emotional. And I think that internalized oppression would be an example of, you know, that that problem. And that's one of the things I was really fascinated about some of your research and everything is that you've actually gone into institutions that that by themselves have even had problems of being racism or being kind of like pockets of the community that may not have that much exclusion within their nature of the way that they are structured. Like if you go to most churches in the African-American community, most of them are, tradi- are predominantly African-American. They may have other members, but the predominant of the membership is African-American. The same with the European churches. The majority of those are European members and even the barbershops. Most barbershops, they may have a couple of barbershops that are integrated, but most barbershops right. are really in the community that they are created at. And even some of your research has done projects to try to get, because these are oftentimes places where a lot of these kind of discussions take place at, whether it's the church or whether it's the barbershop. So I have noticed that you even have programs like Shape Up where you're actually getting people like the barbers engaged in these kind of conversations. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about how that program came about and what its success has been. Sure. Um, Doctors Loretta Jamat and John Jamat, who are colleagues of mine at the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel, um, they were, um, we all together decided collectively to look at the power of barbershops. And as you know, that black barbershops in particular have been significantly um, powerful in times of stress for the black community, including civil rights, um, being a sort of storehouse where you, of places you could trust to politically get at issues of difference and also support black people causes. And um, that's true for uh, beauty salons as well. But um, what is it about a black barbershop that could be potentially healing is the question. And the cultural affirmation of the barbershop, the historical significance, the um, the ways in which you can share, what we learn is, as you know, black men will share a lot at a barbershop. They will not share to a pastor or a partner. They'll disclose very personal information in in a haircut appointment and, by using that as a, using it as a site of health, we were able to get men to um, not only um, learn new information. We we taught the barbers to deliver the information in the cultural styles that they are used to, and that they use often to keep um, um, patrons happy. <laughs> right. So um, you know what we've learned in the course of that. It took us you know five years, but we were targeting uh, not only retaliation violence, but um, sexual safe um, health risks. So um, the barbers were trained to, to teach black men between the ages of 18 and 24 how to reduce their risk around retaliation violence and, and, and engaging in safe sex. And not only was, was the work successful, we found that you know, after the intervention was done, and, and the barbers are some of the best counselors that we could find. Um, and once they integrated their style, they were able to teach the men how to not only uh, use the skills, but we found that we looked at violence rates, and that's, that's fighting with a partner or with a loved one, that at the end of three months after the intervention, uh, we found that being a part of our intervention significantly reduced fighting behavior. So... Um, the research on this is that when you use barbershops, um, it's very beneficial not only reducing fighting behavior because of our work, but um, how to take better care of your health if you look at other folks' work. Um, how do you take care of blood pressure? How do you learn what it means to be engaged around prostate cancer? And, and, and so using a trusted cultural affirmation context like the barbershop 
means you also have a chance to improve the health of men who many people are afraid to even, uh, you know, talk up to about about their health, let alone see them as as uh, caring. And I've never quite understood that. I mean, I'm probably guilty of it. By fact, I know I'm guilty of it to some degree, just as much as anybody else. But it seems that we have a fear of a lot of things that we shouldn't have a fear of, like the medical doctors and the needing to have regular checkups and things of that nature, having our prostate checked on and um, definitely mm-hmm. having the various other things that are on a regular risk in our community on a regular basis. But for whatever reasons, and I don't know what it is psychologically, but it seems like a lot of us have a fear of um, doctors in general, but particularly medical doctors. And we also, a lot of us also have a fear of not even wanting to cope with any kind of medical situation. So I was just wondering, how are you able to deal with folks and their fears of this angle, particularly being one that comes from the psychology background? Because that's definitely a group of people that a lot of times African-American males just seem to have a fear about, even though you know you talk to just about anybody, yeah. they've got some sort of therapy at some point or another in their life, but a lot of times we don't want to address that part of our lives. Yeah. Well, I think a big part of it, as you say, is, you know, the way we think about manhood in our culture in general. And I think one of those aspects of manhood is not appearing weak. And if you you go to the doctor, you find something's wrong with you, you're challenging your sense of strength. And um, the one way that, that I think the barbershops get away from that is that we we trust the men who are doing our hair. Right. And and that means, and we trust to tell them very personal stories that we don't tell anybody else. Um, those are the ingredients you need for men to then look at their manhood very differently, right? Because if I can tell you something personal and you still don't disrespect me, then maybe I, you're somebody, when you give me advice, I'll listen to more so than the other people in my life who expect me to be strong, who expect me to have it together. And um, so part of it is challenging the manhood and, and what it means to be a man and how that, uh, that influences our health choices. And um, the other is I've got to find somebody who will still see me as a man and still challenge me <laughs> about taking care of myself. And I imagine that our change in societies has also impacted a lot of that because I know a lot of our families are we're being raised by single parents, oftentimes single mothers, and a lot of times teenage men and young adults in their 20s are being thrust into, like, that leadership role, almost that fatherhood role way before their time. So it seems like that probably also impacted a lot in our society. You're around the Philadelphia area, and I know mm-hmm. that's a very urban area, so there's probably tons of people that are, you know, being raised by single parents or being raised uh by even non-parents, because both of the parents may be gone, so they may be raised, being raised by their aunts or their grandparents or other folks, and then they wind up being forced into leadership roles that they were not prepared for. So they probably have to learn coping skills in order to deal with that as well. Um, yeah, and I think the you know I think it it doesn't matter, at least in my work, that. Um, we know a lot of the kids whose fathers aren't at home still have to- have access to those fathers, and or men who who are willing to take on the role. And it's always tough when you don't have all both parents around. Um, but uh, one of the challenges is financial, and and the time it takes to spend to keep a house alive, and the gender of the parent isn't the issue, but the context in which we live in. And there are men who know, you know. Um, who have have been raised in single parented homes who've learned a lot about manhood from mothers uh, and their choices and who they decide should be a part of their family. So I do think the issue of leadership is important because the one thing that the barbers were able to do in this example we're talking about is they were also teaching the men about what it means to be black and and male and and deal with racial literacy stuff. So the irony is that that we found that the men who tended 
to not know.